Thank you all for being here. Good evening and welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us this evening. Um, my name is Sean Corsandi. I'm the Executive Director of Landmark West and welcome to Holding the Safety Net in San Juan Hill. Tonight's presentation is being recorded and there will be a Q&A, so feel free to drop a line in our chat or hold your questions until the end and we will have a few moments uh, to ask Jessica all the details that maybe didn't get covered in tonight's talk. A special welcome tonight for any students who are joining us this evening and our special guests from Amsterdam Houses. We're grateful for all of your interest in tonight's program. For those of you joining us for the first time, Landmark West is your good government's grassroots organization focused on preservation, land use, and zoning concerns of the Upper West Side. That runs from 59th Street to 110th Street, Scenic Landmark Riverside Park through Scenic Landmark Central Park. Before we were the Upper West Side, much of the area known as the neighborhood was considered the West End, and that began at 72nd Street. Just south of us was an area called Lincoln Square. Divided by Broadway, a split on Automobile Row, the westernmost half of the neighborhood was variously known as San Juan Hill, and starting in 1916, thanks to the New York Times, Columbus Hill. Tonight is the second public program in our ongoing commitment to this neighborhood and telling the stories of San Juan Hill. You can find uh, all of this on our website, uh, landmarkwest.org slash SJH, which is our San Juan Hill homepage. And keep that in mind because that's where the recording of tonight's presentation will be posted. Tonight's talk will explore the ways in which Black charity and reform initiatives shaped the landscape of San Juan Hill in the early 20th century. Our speaker, Jessica Larson, will focus on the architecture of the buildings constructed to facilitate this work and subsequently how the built environment of San Juan Hill was shaped by community-driven efforts to address poverty. Tonight's talk will emphasize the significance of women to the spatial and welfare programs of the neighborhood. Jessica is a PhD candidate in art and architectural history at the CUNY Graduate Center. Her dissertation examines the architecture of charitable and reform institutions built in Manhattan for Black aid recipients between the Civil War and World War I, with a specific focus on how women reformers directed these designs. Jessica has held fellowships with the American Council of Learned Societies, the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and the Library of Congress in DC. She's also worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Princeton University Art Museum, and the Bruce Museum. Tonight, Jessica joins us from DC, where she is currently a fellow at the Smithsonian Art, American Art Museum and the National Museum of American History. And we are so lucky to have her with us. Without further ado, Jessica Larson. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, everyone joining tonight. And of course, special thanks to uh, Sean and everyone at Landmark West uh, for having me tonight, but also for all of the great work you guys are doing on San Juan Hill. Uh, it is really a shame that it has taken quite this long for San Juan Hill to begin to gain any sort of recognition for the really pivotal role that the neighborhood played in the development of Black New York. Until uh, pretty recently, I'd say um, scholarship has kind of re relegated the neighborhood to um, either this like footnote on the way to Harlem or uh, this necessary casualty in service of Robert Moses's urban renewal program. Uh, I hope tonight we can examine the ways in which San Juan Hill was far more than those things and deserves to be uh, considered in its own right. Uh, by focusing on the charitable institutions that were created in the area, we uh, can distinguish between the, the world that Black reformers created for themselves and their communities um, and work, work against the, uh, the idea of San Juan Hill that many white observers constructed for themselves who really viewed this neighborhood as an island of racialized poverty and really disjointed from this uh, modernizing urban metropolis that uh, outpaced it and surrounded it. Uh, oops, is, are my slides working? Here we go. So there are really endless ways in which we could approach San Juan Hill, but I specifically am interested in how networks of Black charity created and sustained the neighborhood. In this talk, I'm going to walk us through the most prominent institutions that developed there between roughly 1900 and 1915 um, and how they related to each other. This is by no means a capacious or um, universal understanding of the neighborhood. There are, endless, there are many, many ways uh, we could approach it, or there are many other institutions I could also talk about, but 
for sake of time, we are only going to uh, look at some small case studies. Uh, many of these institutions had roots in previously prominent Black Manhattan neighborhoods, and many also later relocated to Harlem and still exist in some capacity today. The history of San Juan Hill is, uh, when it is written about, generally told as a sort of sad but predictable story. I want to push back against that. Closely, closely examining these efforts for racial up uplift through practices of benevol benevolence makes it possible for us to grasp the uh, tremendous consequences of state and municipal authority on the built environments of the poor, but it also illuminates for us how the actions of ordinary people in the past motivated the construction of a more just and compassionate world. Um, and those efforts laid the groundwork for later generations to prosper. Uh, I want to start with some background on Black life in Manhattan in the 19th century because I don't think you can really look at San Juan Hill without, without also keeping in mind the precedence that led to it. Uh, not to mention the fact that the prominence of San Juan Hill comes only 45 years-ish after the end of Southern slavery. During and just following the Civil War, the majority of Manhattan's Black population lived in this area I have marked here uh, in Greenwich Village called uh, popularly and kind of pejoratively Little Africa. Uh, many of these residents had lived in New York since before the state officially outlawed slavery in 1827, uh, but after the Civil War, the population's numbers swelled through migration of formerly enslaved people moving north. Uh, there was also a small but very active population of Afro-Latino immigrants who had escaped political upheaval in uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico, but heavy Caribbean immigration wouldn't really be in full swing until the early 20th century. I'm sure uh, many of you here are familiar with Seneca Village, the Black settlement that had existed in what is today Central Park. Uh, it's speculated that some uh, Seneca Village's residents relocated to Little Africa. It's a very difficult thing for historians to trace definitively, but it's um, a very likely possibility. Uh, with increasing immigration from Southern Europe in the 1870s and 1880s, most of the area's Black residents were, were pushed uptown. Uh, where most settled in this area, I also have demarcated here, called the Tenderloin District. Uh, historians have kind of um, conveniently claimed that two events led to widespread Black migration to San Juan Hill from the Tenderloin in about 1900, uh, the beginning of construction on Penn Station, for one, which destroyed thousands of homes in the area, and the 1900 Tenderloin race riot, wherein white residents and police attacked Black Tenderloiners en masse and destroyed uh, Black homes and businesses. There's definitely truth to these claims, but it's kind of a simplified uh, idea of what really happened. Uh, if we look at the census, we can see that there really was a pretty sizable Black presence in San Juan Hill by 1900. As an example, this is just a snippet from the census for addresses on West 63rd Street, <clears throat> where most of the charities we're going to look at were located. We can see that a Black family was living side by side with a white family um, almost universally throughout Manhattan, as was also true with Little Africa and the Tenderloin. Uh, if a building had any Black tenants, then it would exclusively have Black tenants. White renters would not rent in a building with Black tenants. One um, almost certainly untrue rumor from the time claimed that Black residents began to move into San Juan Hill after a landlord in San Juan Hill openly opened tenancy to Black renters to like essentially spite his neighbors or white tenants. Um, as you can see here on this fire insurance map on the right from 1898, the area was relatively undeveloped, at least in comparison to downtown Manhattan. Nearly all of these empty lots would be rapidly developed in the coming years. There are also a sizable number of frame or wood buildings, which is what that, that yellow color indicates, and the X's above them mean that those are stables. In 1866, all new wood construction in Manhattan was banned, so this is to say that we know that these are not really new developments. Uh, San Juan Hill was frequently slandered as being comprised of dilapidated wooden shanties and outdated hazardous tenements. We can see that here too. All these buildings in pink here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but kind of in the center area um, that is like long kind of block of pink. Um, they don't have any air shafts, um, unlike the ones sort of toward the bottom. Um, this design was outlawed in 1867. So this is all to say that in 1900, this is an area that is pretty industrial, relatively undeveloped. The buildings that are there are not new constructions, really, or at least most of them are not new constructions. 
Um, so it's one of the few areas left in the city where Black residents could afford to live. Um, also with the opening of the elevated or L train, the last stop of which was at 59th Street and 9th Avenue, it was a lot easier for San Juan Hills residents commute to jobs downtown. So this is what kind of spurs growth in around 1900. The first significant institution in the neighborhood was built by, by Union Baptist Church at 202 West 63rd Street in 1901, led by Reverend George Sims. Sims had, like many of his congregants in San Juan Hill, migrated to the North from the South. His parents had been formerly enslaved in Virginia, and Sims envisioned Union Baptist as a center of financial, social, and spiritual support for fellow Black Southern migrants. There's a lot to say about Sims. He was a really fascinating, impressive person, um, and he actually becomes really prominent in Harlem. Uh, and works alongside figures like Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And he was definitely very aware of the importance of property development and ownership for black for the black community. Um, he sort of prefigures Philip Payton in certain ways. Uh, while working as an elevator operator, he was able to earn a degree in mechanical engineering, which is I mean, like a very unthinkable achievement for the time. In 1898, Sims established the first location of Union Baptist Church in a storefront at 211 West 63rd Street, but it soon became really clear that the space was way too small and not going to accommodate all of the people that uh, wanted to uh, come to the church or uh, engage in the social work Sims had envisioned for the congregation. So by July 1901, the congregation raised enough funds to erect New York City's first purpose-built Black Baptist Church at 202 West 63rd Street. Of course, Black Baptist churches existed in New York for quite a long time before that, but they had always been in either adapted buildings, adapted churches, or renovated other sorts of buildings, like blacksmith shops were pretty common. Um, you might be thinking that this building does not really look like a church, um, uh, as is sort of typical with this research. There isn't a lot of clear documentation to explain exactly why the design is the way it is. There aren't a huge number of written records that articulate these ideas, um, and no four floor plans survive, of course. But I think a good guess is that one, Sims and the congregation were shrewd enough to know that this needed to function very differently than a typical church and thus needed a very different type of design. And two, from the start, Sims was very ambitious in terms of Union Baptist building program. He eventually actually creates a real estate firm wherein congregants could purchase a stake in a real estate company. That he that he ran, uh, and I think early on he had his sights set on ultimately constructing a much more traditional church once funds were raised. So he had a vision from the start, um, and that's exactly what happened. So um, in 1904, Sims and the Union Baptist Congregation purchased the two adjoining lots at 204 to 206 West 63rd Street and commissioned architect James Riley Gordon, who is probably not a, a name familiar to anyone here, but uh, he has a prominent name in Texas. He uh, designed most of Texas's uh, courthouses. Um, but they commissioned James Riley Gordon to draft plans for a new two-story building to serve um, solely as a church. As you can see, this was more in line with what we expect from standard church architecture. There were occasionally meetings and children's classes held in the building, but most of the social life facilitated by the church was still held in 202 West 63rd Street next door. And I don't want to dwell on the actual church building too long, because as amazing as it is, it just wasn't the primary site of reform work. But I want to emphasize just how impressive this building was when you consider uh, just how difficult it would have been for a Black congregation in one of the city's poorest neighborhoods to commission a purpose-built architect design structure at the time. I really love this photo here. Um, granted, it's taken decades later. You can see how some of the building has fallen into disrepair a little bit. Um, but it's taken when Father Divine's Peace Mission movement, um, which maybe you are familiar with, maybe you aren't, uh, but they briefly used the building as essentially a community living facility. Um, but I love this photo because it emphasizes the scale of the building and just how monumental this project was. Um, maybe a little too monumental, uh, Union Baptist is plunged into very serious debt over this for a very long time. Sims actually publicly appeals to John D. Rockefeller to help pay the mortgage, which, I mean, Rockefeller seemingly just ignored or probably never even saw. But regardless, this is a huge financial drain, uh, but it is an extremely impressive, beautiful building. 
Uh, but back to 202 uh, West 63rd, again, it was designed to be multi-purpose. Purportedly, the building only accommodated roughly 200 congregants, a comparatively low number. Later, when Union Baptist moves to Harlem, they can fit about 1,000 people in the building, just as a comparison. You see here on this fire insurance map that the address is labeled a plumber shop. This was a common strategy in reform architecture. The ground floor was designed to be a commercial space to be rented out to fund the charity work in the upper stories. A number of businesses operated out of this unit over the years, including an undertaker that Sims might have had some sort of financial investment in. Actually, Sims's brother was also an undertaker who lived across the street and had a business on the other side of the street. Uh, this building was originally three stories. There's a fourth story in this photo, which we'll get to later, but it was added later. Uh, the second and third stories were used by the church. You can see in this photograph that there is a stairwell on the left side of the building so that the essentially to divide the commercial and reform spaces so that they, you can navigate them separately and they don't need to intersect. Uh, they likely used movable partitions to change how the space was used throughout the day, which was a very common strategy. Sims was very vocal about his concern for the welfare of San Juan Hill's children and the desperate need for child care institutions in the neighborhood. And it's it's most likely that aside from church services, these top two floors were um, given over to religiously based children's classes and activities. So the standard practice would have been for Sims's wife to head this branch, um, kind of the social service sector as was the arrangement at uh, similar San Juan Hill institutional churches. Sims was married twice, first to a woman named Mary E. Davis. Uh, like the vast majority of records that still exist on details of women's involvement in public life in the 19th and 20th century or early 20th centuries, Mary's contributions are really only hinted at, but publications like the New York Age and uh, Colored Amer American Magazine noted that she was instrumental in the charitable side of Union Baptist. Um, tellingly, Mary died in 1908, which um, I'll mention it later, but this coincides with a huge um, management transition um, for the services of the building, and I don't think this is a coincidence. Um, I am guessing that once Mary died, there was a dearth in leadership and things needed to be altered. Um, uh, Sims quickly, kind of kind of too quickly, uh, married again after her death to a, a fellow Virginian named Louise Russell, and Louise then uh, did uh, take over the charitable side of the church. Uh, after the main church building next door at 204 West 63rd Street opened in 1904, the building at 202 West 63rd wasn't required for religious services and could be given over more fully to the church's mission of social work, particularly with children. At this point, San Juan Hill was rapidly developing, and even the city's white elite had turned their attention to conditions in the neighborhood, which were becoming notorious, but also wildly distorted and simplified and exaggerated. Uh, these are examples of particularly vile caricatures of Black residents of San Juan Hill that were published in the newspaper The Sun, which um, really just maligned residents as gamblers and sex workers. Um, and just to take a second to compare how uh, black women more caricature versus a more realistic depiction. Uh, this contemporaneous photo here on the right, which I think is like very strikingly similar formally to this, I mean, albeit the, the quality is terrible and I hope you can like kind of make out what is going on, but this caricature on the left, they are formally very similar, um, but they tell very different stories. I think these women in the photo are probably working poor. They probably maybe lower middle class. Um, but they uh, are very composed, are very dignified, um, and they're adhering to standards of conventional respectability um, that was probably very ubiquitous at the time. Uh, granted, this photo was taken in the Tenderloin District on West 30th Street, not San Juan Hill, but the point remains the same. Um, this is an image of what life might have actually looked like versus this very horrible racist caricature. Um, but this is this caricature is the sort of thing that white New Yorkers are seen um, because so many of them are not really venturing into these Black neighborhoods. In 1905, it was announced that San Juan Hill would soon be home to a new comparatively massive low-income housing project called Phipps Houses Number no. Two. 
This project was planned as a model tenement. In many ways, model tenements prefigured public housing, but they were privately funded projects, generally financed by partnerships between housing corporations and philanthropists. Uh, these were not completely benevolent endeavors. The idea was that they would um, provide quality, slightly below market rate housing that was still that still turned some sort of modest profit for shareholders. Also, to paraphrase one, one reformer, um, the point was to treat charity like a business. Uh, implicit, too, was the idea that the middle class and wealthy white funders and managers could in some way shape how the poor lived. Since the 1890s, model tenements, primarily for white immigrants, were built throughout the city. Um, of course, those excluded Black tenants. This changed, at least for San Juan Hill, in 1901, when the neighborhood received their first model tenement called the Tuskegee at 210 to 218 West 62nd Street, which was exclusively for Black residency. This building was relatively small for a model tenement and only took up two lots, but it included the most modern design innovations and amenities and quickly proved a financial asset to its funders. In 1905, philanthropist and industrialist Henry Phipps Jr., who had made his fortune as Carnegie's business partner, uh, began constructing model tenements too. First, Phipps houses number one on the east side, which was mostly for German immigrants. This was a particularly well-funded and beautiful um, building with a famous residential architect, Grossfriner Atterbury, attached. Phipps was quickly persuaded to continue these projects, and also in 1905, uh, white reformers Mary White Ovington and John Milholland, who both of them would be central in forming the NAACP a little bit later, um, they convinced Phipps to build San Juan Hill, a second model tenement um, with West 63rd Street. This new project was much larger than the Tuskegee and covered eight lots. Uh, this new addition was greeted very favorably by San Juan Hills residents and reformers who, at least according to the city's leading black newspaper, the New York Age, were particularly approving of the plans to make women's invo involvement central to the building's management and services. Originally, the structure consi consisted of 164 apartments with two bedroom, three bedroom, and four bedroom options. In keeping with modern standards, as well as increasingly strict housing legislation, the building was fireproofed and equipped with steam heat, hot water, and private bathrooms. Uh, I do want to emphasize, though, that these sort of building projects were not really intended to truly change class or racial structures. They were meant to alleviate the conditions of poverty while not really shaking up the social order. Uh, they have historically been criticized, as NYCHA has, for not really being available to the poorest of the poor, but those who are already in some sort of way upwardly mobile. I think this ad, which was placed in the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, it's really telling, it's a really interesting image. Um, when you read the subheading, it says best places, best families, you assume that that is referring to Phipps Houses Number 2 and its residents. Um, but if you keep reading, no, it is not. It is an ad for an employment bureau that was included in the building's ground floor, mostly to fill domestic work positions in white households. So the best places and best families are the white employers and their homes. A lot of white labor reform work was motivated by a desire to maintain a cheap and subservient labor force. Regardless, most prominent um, among these proposed inclusions was the creation in the building of a space for child care run by the neighborhood's women. This was a crucial proposal because it was one of the few ways in which San Juan Hills residents were able to leverage some sort of degree of control over the building's design and use. It also brought the otherwise small, hyper-local efforts of, San of Union Baptist into the larger machine of white reform. It's unclear exactly how this happened or who approached who, but in 1905 or maybe 1906, the planners of Phipps Houses Number 2 came to an agreement with an organization called the New York Free Kindergarten Association for Colored Children to provide the kindergarten space to conduct their work in the building. The Free Kindergarten was founded in 1895 by Black educator and activist Elizabeth Jennings Graham, who, I mean, I'm sure some people know who that is, but she is more famous for um, her legal battles against segregation in the 1890s. Um, white children's author and noted paper cutting artist Lucy Gibbons Morris and a woman named or just listed as Mrs. Edward Curtis, very frustratingly, um, women in the 19th century were often in print just referred to by their husband's name. Um, so it can be very hard to track them down. So I don't know her real first name, but in a Mrs. Edward Curtis. 
Uh, though Black women were the most central figures in this organization, the intent was to forge an interracial institution to promote Black reform through white partnership and to signify the importance of children's welfare regardless of race. They were soon joined by a cadre of women reformers. Um, some were white, but mostly were Black, including poet um, H. Cordelia Ray, uh, educator and suffragist, and the wife of Henry Highland Garnett, Sarah J. Garnett, and Black educator Joan Imogen Howard. The kindergarten, the kindergarten served children five years old and under, and was first operated out of the basement and living room of Graham's five-story row house on West 41st Street. Free kindergartens and kind of kindergartens in general were some of the most revolutionary and widespread contributions of reform work in the progressive era for a lot of reasons. Firstly, they were indicative of larger ideas about the value of childhood as this unique and discrete stage of life that was precious and deserved to be treated as such. Um, importantly, kindergartens as well as day nurseries were also a response to the increasing prevalence of women working outside the home. While reformers, who were almost always from the middle or even upper classes, weren't particularly thrilled with the idea of mothers working outside the domestic sphere, reformers did have to kind of concede that women, poor women, did generally have to make ends meet by working. Um, and it was better for their children to be in somewhere like a free kindergarten than to either be left alone or watched by a stranger. Um, also, like model tenements, kindergartens were a way to instill middle class ideals and standards um, into poor children early and to try to have some sort of hand in the way that they behaved. Children in San Juan Hill were of particular concern, largely because of persistent racist stereotypes regarding both their unruly behavior, but also the perceived unfitness of their mothers to care for them. This was something that comes up a lot in reform and charity periodicals and also just more popular publications like newspapers. There was a lot of hand wringing from um, white New Yorkers who were afraid of the violence of the neighborhood's children sort of like spilling over into other parts of the city. This is a drawing by the famous Ash Can artist George Bellows of black children engaged in a tin can battle in San Juan Hill. You can see that in the background, the adults are just sort of watching, not intervening. And then these tenements in the background too are also like visibly falling apart. Um, people are spilling out, meaning that they're obviously overcrowded. If you look very closely, you can't really see it so well in this reproduction, but there's a sign that says for rent, meaning that in spite of how overcrowded they are, they are willing to become even more overcrowded. Crowded. I think it's um, immensely unlikely that Bellows ever witnessed the scene. I think it's probably impossible. Um, and I've read really sensational newspaper stories from the same time relaying a similar sort of story about children engaged in tan cam battles in San Juan Hill. And I wonder if Bellows was more illustrating something he read in a newspaper or some other periodical. But um, the bigger point is made that the issue of Black children running amok, particularly in public space, was something on the minds of New Yorkers. By 1899, Graham's home couldn't accommodate the large numbers of applicants who wanted to place their children in the free kindergarten. At the suggestion of reform photographer Jacob Reese, the organization first rented a vacant storefront at 242 West 60th Street to be more centrally, centrally located to the city's Black community. Again, within their first year in the neighborhood, the enrollment grew from 16 to 80 children, so they needed um, to expand into a new location. Uh, though the plan was to move into the basement space and potentially some of the ground floor rooms of Phipps House's number two, the kindergarten needed space in the interim to do their work. So they brokered a deal with Union Baptist to use their spaces at 202 West 63rd until the model tenement was finished. It seems like this went pretty well, though. They had constant demand for their services, and I'm guessing the building, given that it was prob probably already holding various children's classes and activities, was better equipped for their work than somewhere like a storefront or even the model tenement's basement space, um, which, based on building plans, um, was probably intentionally multi-purpose. A lot of the things we associate with children's spaces in the progressive era are absent. And it's particularly cu curious that there is no egress directly to the street, which would have been really important because the kindergarten was open to all of the neighborhood's children, even if they did not live in the model tenement. Um, so it seems like 202 West 63rd was probably a very attractive option for the free kindergarten. 
uh, the free kindergarten quickly decided to move their primary operations to 202 West 63rd and make that their base while still running classes and childcare out of Phipps Houses Number no. 2. In about 1906, the organization also changed their name to the Mary F. Walden Kindergarten for Colored Children after one of their biggest donors um, named Mary Walden uh, died. Uh, I'm guessing other things might have motivated that change as well, but I'm not sure. So by 1906, the free get kindergarten has a pretty significant foothold in San Juan Hill and demand for their services is only growing. I'm going to return to 202 West 63rd Street in a little bit, but I wanna note that the free kindergarten isn't at all the only institution in the neighborhood, not even the only one on the same block that is focused on children's welfare. I think the New York Free Kindergarten Association for Colored Children or the Walton Kindergarten is particularly interesting and important because it was entirely run by women and most leadership roles went to black women, but there are other institutions that were doing similar work. Just down the street from Union Baptist and 202 was the Henrietta Industrial School, which was run by the Children's Aid Society. This institution is very different from the Free Kindergarten. It was entirely white run. Um, some people might have heard of the Children's Aid Society before, particularly for their notorious and not so morally upright orphan train program, but they had locations throughout the city, um, but this was the only one that was dedicated to um, the instruction of Black children. It didn't start out that way. The building was originally built in the early 1890s as essentially a um, either a workhouse or like a kind of a halfway house for recently released convicts. Even though this is only about 10 years before San Juan Hill begins to take off, the area was um, much sparser. You can see from this fire insurance map from 1891 that most of the lots on the block are still vacant. This didn't last long though, and in 1892, the Children's Aid Society purchased the four-story building to use as an industrial school. Industrial schools have a pretty negative legacy, um, particularly regarding race. The point, as the name implies was that these were schools that prepared children for work and didn't really bother with um, many of the fields we often associate today with like a well-rounded humanist education. Uh, sometimes these institutions sort of stood in place for things like what we um, might think of today as akin to like juvenile hall. Um, a child could be legally mandated to attend, but this wasn't always the case and I doubt this was the case with the Henrietta. So the positive argument for them was that they essentially gave poor students valuable training in more manual work, like say cobblering or sewing, but um, that they could realistically lead to work. The negative side, particularly in the case of industrial schools in the South, um, was that they didn't really encourage class mobility. Again, like Phipps House's number two's employment bureau, um, they were more interest in, interested in producing a manual labor force and enforcing the status quo. I haven't found many um, specific references to student de demographics in the first few years of the industrial school's existence, but I think most students in the 1890s would have been white. Uh, what is really curious about the school, though, which impacted the architecture, is that by 1898, it was renovated to accommodate the unusually high number of disabled children that attended. According to the Children's Aid Society's founder, Charles Loring Brace, disability was remarkably high amongst the neighborhood's children. In response, several rooms in the building were reserved for the instruction of disabled children and new furniture of varying heights and chairs that were able to recline were purchased to make things um, more comfortable for differently abled students. Uh, to the left of the building uh, was a large masonry gate with stable style doors. These would have opened on into something called a horse walk, um, essentially a passageway that allowed a carriage to be brought from the street to the rear yard. Um, upon expansion of the school services to include the teaching and care of disabled children, the Henrietta purchased a wagonette to transport them. This horse-drawn vehicle was equipped with a glass cover to protect against winter weather, and it would essentially go around the neighborhood and pick up children in the morning um, and then drop them off in the evening. This also brought the school's women reformers into the homes of these children because usually or often they would have to carry them up and down stairs. Uh, this led to like a little bit of a glimpse into the children's homes and that shaped how reformers um, understood how environmental factors shaped children's behavior. By the first few years of the 20th century, the student body was almost entirely comprised of black students. Um, it was nominally exclusively for black children, but I do think there were a few white children too. 
A central entrance can be seen on photographs of the exterior, which would have welcomed visitors into an area for reception where children would be processed and other administrative work done. However, the children, whether disabled or able-bodied, would have likely been filtered through the side entrance, keeping them out of sight from administrative functions of the school. Upon entering the, the building, children were likely then led down into the basement level where they would find Washington toilet facilities. This is also true with how Sam Juan Hill would, or sorry, Phipps House number two would have brought children in too. Um, after coming in from the dirty streets of Sam Juan Hill, the children were required to wash up uh, before navigating the other areas of the building. In the basement, there was probably also a playroom as well as a space for laundry, cooking, and a dining area. Sounds weird to us today, but in the 19th century, um, in early 20th century, it was common to have dining areas um, located in the basements of institutions and even sometimes in um, houses. The curriculum of industrial schools was deeply gendered. Girls learned skills that would prepare them for domestic service, while boys learned manual trades. So girls likely also learned a lot in the basement and were instructed in the kitchen and dining areas. This is where they would have learned the basic skills that would later um, they would later use to either care for their family or particularly in the case of Black girls and women who primarily worked in domestic employment, serve middle-class white families. Uh, what white reformers for places like the Henry uh, Henrietta hoped was that their instruction would condition young girls early for work in serving trades. For this purpose too, the Henrietta included something called a model flat, um, which is what is in this upper right corner here. It's essentially an aspirational mock of an apartment where girls would practice cleaning and tidying prototypical middle-class furniture. Photographs from the Henrietta, such as this one, which is kind of unsettling, show this um, white woman kind of observing and watching um, as her students uh, learn how to do these sort of tasks. Similarly, boys would learn skills that prepared them for future trades, such as cobbling and carpentry. This was all likely located in the upper stories, a standard practice of utilizing the primary and most well-lit and ventilated areas of building for men's purposes and relegating women's work to the basement where they could also oversee children. Uh, photographs show the boys seeming to enjoy their time at the Henrietta far more than the girls. Photos show young boys gleefully learning riflery and matching uniforms and practicing music in a marching band as well. The building included a boys club with more recreational activities such as a pool table. Uh, Thelonious Monk, who grew up in Phipps House's number two, later recounted policing young children during uh, pool games at the Henrietta, where his mother worked as a cook. This sort of sociability was encouraged far more in young boys who were expected to enter public life in a way that young girls just weren't. Even though the white women who ran the day-to-day -day operations of the Henrietta definitely, definitely did not anticipate that um, young black boys would eventually become prominent fixtures in New York society circles, um, there was still this expectation that such activities would reinforce the natural place of women in the home and men in more public facing roles. So this sort of school, regardless of the assessments that historians have made about industrial, um, industrial schools, would have been attractive for a number of reasons for parents in the neighborhood. Public schools in New York State had actually been pretty integrated since about the mid-19th century, or at least in a technical sense they were integrated. Um, but in 1900, state legislation was passed that really codified that. So a lot of children in San Juan Hill would have been attending public schools in the area alongside white children. Uh, the closest elementary school for most of them would have been PS 141 at West 58th and Amsterdam Ave. This is where Thelonious Monk attended. And I actually think Benny Carter, the musician, might have gone there too. Uh, this was also dicey, though. And Monk wrote about this later. But to just walk the few blocks children would need to to traverse to go from West 63rd to PS 141, they needed to cross over Amsterdam Avenue, which was understood as the sort of dividing line between the black and white communities. Black children were regularly attacked by white children once they did this. This was not an insignificant factor. Um, this was a real worry for black mothers and many boys that they didn't send their children to school specifically because of this threat. So while the prospect of sending their children to the Henrietta um, probably engendered its own sort of worries. Um, it might have been considered a safer option than sending your child to PS 141. And at least somewhere like the Henrietta might um, lead to steady employment. 
And this issue of Amsterdam Ave acting as this color line in Du Bois's term, dividing the black community of San Juan Hill and the whites, mostly Irish, just slightly to the east, proved a particularly vexing problem for one of the area's other most prominent reform institutions, St. Cyprian's Episcopal Church and Parish House. Um, this was cited just to the east of Amsterdam Ave on West 63rd. Um, and this was noted also as a particularly difficult trek for those who wanted to attend religious services who maybe lived in somewhere like Phipps Houses Number 2 um, and had to cross Amsterdam Ave just one block away to get there. The congregation, though, really just tried to position themselves as part of an interracial dialogue and tried to lessen the animosity between Blacks and whites in the neighborhood. They publicized that they were open to the areas I was interested to. Um, I, I doubt that many attended, but... Um, the point was made that they were at least accepting of the possibility of Irish and German attendees. So St. Cyprian's was originally founded at 175 and to 177 West 63rd Street in 1905 <clears throat> in response to the neighborhood's growing West Indian population, which was heavily Episcopalian. Like Union Baptist, St. Cyprian's first built a structure to house social work prior to building an actual purpose-built chapel. However, unlike Union Baptist, St. Cyprian's was never really able to construct a separate church for worship. The creation of uh, the congregation was done under the direction of the White Run Episcopal Diocese, but the man at the helm was Reverend John W. Johnson. Like George Sims at Union Baptist, Johnson, as well as his wife, Harriet, had migrated from Virginia to New York. Unlike Sims, though, who really founded Union Baptist, Baptist through his own initiative, Johnson was probably appointed by the Episcopal City Mission Society, a branch of the diocese that focused specifically on social work, though he was obviously very invested regardless. So the other implication of this is that while St. Cyprian's was mostly Black run, the funding was coming from a white umbrella organization that had a strong say in how things were done and um, did appoint some white reformers to help manage the institution. So while in 1900, when Union Baptist was getting off the ground, the majority of Black residents of San Juan Hill had come from the South, or their parents maybe had migrated from the South. Between about 1905 and 1910, this has completely changed, and the composition of the neighborhood was also changing how Black New Yorkers viewed each other and how whites were viewing the neighborhood. As an example, this is the cover of a dime store detective novel from 1910 called um, The Brady's and the Voodoo Queen which follows the two titular white detective detectives called the Brady's, they're a son and his father, I think, um, who are enlisted to hunt down a Haitian voodoo practitioner in San Juan Hill who has kidnapped a white infant for sacrifice. Uh, something particularly interesting, if you read the whole text, which I don't really recommend, it's really racist and not very good, um, is how the built environment factors in. Uh, the voodoo queen and her aides are able to essentially elude capture through the navigation of this crumbling lanth, labyrinthine, labyrinthine um, tenement world um, that is entirely foreign to the white detectives who have no idea how to navigate it. Uh, the cover illustration shows the interior of a dilapidated row house or tenement. Uh, the voodoo queen has a snake wrapped around her neck and she's raving as these heroic white detectives easily fend off their attackers. Um, it's all very racist and raci racially charged. Even the costumes are obviously drawn from minstrelsy. Um, though the pulp novel was obviously sensational, um, its content pointed to real anxieties over West Indian immigration, as well as a perception of Sam on Hill as this malignant force in Manhattan's otherwise ordered landscape. To outsiders, these immigrants were often conceived of as anti-Christian, unchristian, inclined towards fanaticism, and not to be trusted with the welfare of children. For St. Cyprian's, addressing these unwarranted critiques aligned with the church's institutional mission. Also, St. Cyprian's was explicit that they wanted to reinforce shared struggles between West Indian immigrants and Southern Black migrants who did not need to view each other as impediments to forming a, co a coherent Black American identity. Um, the social work at St. Cyprian's was first established in two renovated row houses. Based on evidence from fire insurance maps, these row houses were old law, meaning built prior to 1879 in design and three stories with a basement, uh, with the party wall between them either partly or fully torn down. 
Very few contemporary references exist to indicate exactly what services were offered in these two row houses in 1905, but it seems to have been primarily children's and mother's activities, wherein members created crafts like drawings, needlepoint, and doll making to be sold at fundraisers. Um, there were also children's musical recitals. Uh, the City Mission Society also purchased the three row houses directly to the east. Um, based on details included in fire insurance maps, these three row houses um, were probably by the same design, um, built by the same developer. However, um, none of St. Cyprian's social work is listed as actually operating out of th these three row houses. Um, and records indicate that the City Mission Society probably rented them out for revenue. According to the 1905 New York State Census, Johnson and his family actually lived at one of them, 177 West 63rd, uh, which was not unusual. And white families are all listed as residing in the other four row houses. Um, so based on the size of the families, they probably did not occupy the entirety of the structures, but perhaps just rented one or two floors in each building and the other floors might have been used for social work. Uh, an advertisement for the rental of 169 West 63rd lists the building as including 10 rooms and one bath, which is kind of large. Uh, for the building at 175 West 63rd Street, it seems as though the building was partially used by St. Cyprian's, while a white family rented a portion of the building, probably the upper stories. So the an organization like St. Cyprian's is being very shrewd about the way they are managing their money, and they are not the only Black institution that is doing the, the, have, making these sort of financial arrangements. After significant difficulties securing a location willing to rent to an organization serving predominantly Southern Black women, the first Colored Young Women's Christian Association, or YWCA, an offshoot of the YMCA, rented the row house at 169 West 63rd Street from the church in October 1905. Very little is available regarding the organization's use of the building, um, and they weren't there that long, but the space was multi-purpose, and the primary intention was to provide a transitionary home for new arrivals to the city. An advertisement for the building services indicated that they focused on Bible study and social gatherings, but also that there were furnished rooms in the building available for respectable women. This was a pretty common reform. This was pretty common in reform organizations. Um, these sort of institutions often would um, have rooms reserved or available, um, or possibly one big dormitory style room. Um, where women who were new arrivals to the city who maybe had nowhere to stay, had no connections in the city, could sleep temporarily until they found something more permanent. Usually these situations were heavily monitored and women staying there wouldn't be allowed to allowed in during the day. The idea was that they would either be working or looking for work during the day. Many homeless shelters today operate under the same sort of policy. Um, but also <laughs> the uh, the other implicit idea is that if women are sleeping there, then the reformers can sort of monitor their sexual activity and preserve their chastity. Uh, the color YWCA's use of St. Cyprian's building only lasted 16 months. Although the organization still had a full year left on their lease, the City Mission Society forced them to evict so they could demolish the three row houses at 169 to 173 West 63rd and construct the new parish house in their place. The YWCA relocated in to West 53rd, which was an area that sometimes gets lumped in with San Juan Hill, but the demographics were a bit different. There was a pretty sizable Black population along West 53rd, but they differed from um, those about 10 blocks north in that most on West 53rd were um, more economically well-off, maybe middle class, and with it some, some form of an education. A lot of reformers would have chosen to live closer to West 53rd than West 63rd. Um, their eviction did not entirely end the colored uh, YWCA's relationship with St. Cyprian's. <clears throat> Upon completion of the church's new parish house, the organization did host various exercise classes or um, uh, sports games uh, in the building's new gymnasium. Uh, from the outset in 1905, St. Cyprian's church and mission were heavily attended, and it was clear that the renovated row houses were not sufficient to accommodate the, surface, the services the churches intended to offer. Familiar story. In May 1908, the congregation's new purpose-built parish house at 167 to 171 West 63rd Street opened to much celebration. The New York Age wrote that the building's completion, quote, marked an epoch in real social settlement work in the history of our race in New York. Liking and Baptist first building, this was sort of an odd choice. 
St. Cyprian's parish house was very evidently a product of the Episcopalian tradition in the North uh, to clearly express the denomination's English origins, as well as produce a standardized national style. Episcopalian churches began to adopt Gothic and Romanesque-inspired designs in the 1840s. This was facilitated as well by the growing abundance of immigrant craft workers who had trained in Europe and specialized in carving wood and stone ornamentation. Compared to similarly ornamented Episcopalian structures throughout the city, St. Cyprian's was remarkably small and unassuming. Though the church planned to expand the parish house to include four to five stories, this never materialized. As well, the building was very curiously not on access, as you can see, with the entrance positioned on the left side of the building. These qualities conveyed the Episcopalian backing of the work while still reminding observers that this settlement existed outside of the white elite reputation that had long defined New York City's Episcopalian tradition. Despite growing need for St. Cyprian's services and pleading from Reverend Johnson, uh, the diocese was not interested in allocating the necessary funds to support further expansion of the building, which was badly needed. In 1908, Johnson wrote to the diocese explaining how dire the situation was. The facilities were unsanitary. It was difficult to heat the rooms. Um, everything was persistently cold, um, and it was extremely expensive to maintain. This all meant that the social clubs and classes the parish house wanted to expand on, mostly for young girls and boys, um, had to be cut. A 1907 newspaper announcement of the church's plans for the new building stated that the final result would be uh, five stories with a basement, with the first floor serving as an auditorium built to serve 600. The upper floors would include rooms for clubs, classes, a day nursery, and apartments for the staff. And the basement would include a gymnasium, lockers, and showers. Ultimately, the church was forced to manage its expectations and reconsider how these services could be offered in a much more limited scope because this building program never materialized. Regardless of these setbacks and the funding discrepancies that came with Black institutional work, the new parish house and renovated row houses held an impressive amount and range of social work. Unlike virtually all other institutions in the neighborhood, St. Cyprian's uh, not only offered training and an employment bureau for women's domestic work, but actively employed neighborhood girls and women, and Harriet Johnson managed most of this work. Just as a reminder, Harriet is the wife of uh, the reverend. The parish house included a needlework guild, wherein women and girls were paid five to 20 cents an hour to sew in men clothing, and then the resulting garments were then sold to neighborhood residents. St. Cyprian's wasn't, um, of course, the only institution to do this, but it was also pretty common to not just not pay these women doing the work for this sort of um, labor under this sort of premise that they're being trained and so they don't need to be paid. Um, but it was actually sort of common to not just not pay them, but to actually make the women pay the institution for the garments um, that they made. So uh, while it does, maybe doesn't seem super radical, uh, it is kind of novel and um, interesting that St. Cyprian's is act actually actively paying women in the neighborhood to um, work with them. Women were also employed in the parish house's laundry service for six to nine dollars per week, uh, though the property included a spacious backyard that would have been ideal for children's recreation. The parish uh, how, um, found that the neighborhood's residents were willing to pay more for laundry that could be dried in the open air. Um, instead of like a dingy basement. Thus, the yard was given over to laundry work instead of children's play area, which would have been more conventional. Um, this wasn't something Harriet Johnson was particularly happy about. Uh, later, too, a printing press was added to the building, which primarily employed the neighborhood's West Indian men. So you're probably getting the idea that this is um, a, kind of a large-scale operation, even if it's operating out of sort of small spaces. One of the institution's most successful endeavors, though, was the inclusion of something called a milk station. Uh, following renovations, this service was located in two rooms in the basement of the row houses and was equipped with modern appliances for modifying milk to be safe for infants. For children's health professionals in the early 20th century, contaminated milk was one was among the most pressing reform concerns and uh, the cause of alarmingly high infant mortality rates. Urban reformers worked to integrate certified milk dispensaries into impoverished neighborhoods, which um, provided either inexpensive or free and in, uh, milk and generally included medical exam services and health instruction in the centers. In partnership with the New York Milk Committee, St. Cyprian's 
uh, milk station precipitated a dramatic fall in infant mortality amongst Black babies in the neighborhood. One report claimed that prior to the inclusion of the milk station, Reverend Johnson buried on average one Black infant every other day. This number fell to a mere six children in one year. So you can see why um, milk stations were uh, one of the most the one of the services reformers were most ardent about. Exterior photographs show how the row houses were adapted to facilitate easier access to the basement services. The three stoops were shorn off so that access led directly down into the basement and the entrance to the far right row house was enlarged. The first story's doorways were also converted into large windows. The milk station served about 70 babies per day um, with each bottle containing roughly 10 feedings. Remarkably, the doctors and nurses seem to have mostly been black. The primary doctor for the baby's clinic was a man named E.P. Roberts, who lived in the more elite black neighborhood along West 53rd Street. In spite of this, the experience of picking up milk from the dispensary would likely not have been one of, um, one of the most positive experiences for mothers in the neighborhood. Mothers were generally pressured to attend classes on how best to raise their children or even to agree to allow reformers to come home with them and expect their, inspect their homes. Um, obviously a very uh, kind of condescending experience. Further, if a mother did not have a sufficient reason for choosing not to breastfeed, uh, she would likely be denied milk altogether. Breastfeeding was not always possible for working mothers who were away from their infants for long stretches of the day. For this reason, reformers were often hesitant to offer milk stations because again, they didn't want um, really to encourage mothers to be working outside the home if they didn't need to. Really interestingly, though, women who sought out the milk station services pushed back on this sort of moralizing and were able to exert some degree of control over its operations. In a report by the White Run New York Milk Committee, nurses expressed exasperation with the women of San Juan Hill, who the nurses felt they had no hold over and couldn't be convinced to attend classes. Uh, the nurses had to eventually relent and offer a modified procedure for dispensing milk. Rather than require women to obtain every bottle directly from St. Cyprian's, the nurses allowed for a system where mothers could prepare their own formula at home from um, samples of unmodified milk. This gave Black mothers significantly more control over their families' budgets, their time management and time spent with their children, and of course, the flexibility to work during the day. So St. Cyprian's was a crucial site for healthcare. Uh, in the late 1920s, the main site for health services in San Juan Hill would be the Columbus Hill Health Center, which actually um, took over the Henrietta Industrial Schools building. I'm not going to get too much into this institution just because it's a bit outside of the time frame I focus on. But by the 1920s, um, at least in the North, uh, indus industrial schools have really fallen out of favor. And Rockefeller provides funding to transition the building from the industrial school to a health center, which was staffed um, by black, not entirely by black nurses, by, but by many black nurses, as you see the, in these really wonderful photographs. Before this, though, beginning in 1907, the most significant black healthcare initiative in the neighborhood was an organization called Stillman House, which was a branch of the famous Henry Street settlement on the Lower East Side. If you don't know, the Henry Street settlement was, I mean, it is, it's still around today, but a white-run institution for social services, um, when it was founded by reformer Lillian Wald in 1893, it was almost entirely for white European immigrants. Um, many of them were Jewish. Uh, Wald, was, Wald was persuaded to support the creation of a branch in San Juan Hill by a woman named Elizabeth Tyler. Uh, Tyler was the first Black nurse employed by the Henry Street Settlement. After being confronted with the disappointing reality that Black patients did not seek the services of the Henry Street Settlement, mostly because the Henry Street Settlement location simply did not exist in neighborhoods with Black residents, uh, Tyler sought out the janitors. Um, back then, janitors sort of functioned like super superintendents do today um, of tenements in San Juan Hill to ask whether they were aware of sick, sick tenants. Startled too by the staggering infant mortality rate, one report recorded that in San Juan Hill, 314 out of 1,000 babies would die within their first year, um, compared to, for example, 73 babies out of 1,000 on the Lower East Side. Uh, Tyler realized that the scope of her work was far larger than one nurse could possibly accomplish, so fellow Black nurse Edith Carter was hired to assist. 
The two established relationships with neighborhood churches and doctors to seek out sick residents. Tyler and Carter made a convincing case to Wald to fund the rental of a storefront at 205 West 60th Street in 1908 and called it the Stillman House. Um, just as a note, they had, if you look online, you're going to see a lot of different addresses for Stillman House. They moved around a lot. Um, they kind of end at 205 West 60th Street. Uh, the organization was headed by Black reformer Ida A. Morgan, who lived in one of the neighborhood's model tenements. The new branch subdivided the ground floor to accommodate four rooms, each of which was multi-purpose. The front room, which was the largest, was used as an assembly room, a classroom, and a gymnasium. Another room was used for classes in carpentry and sewing, and the other two rooms rotated use between a kitchen, dining room, storage, and additional classrooms. A photograph, I know it's not the best quality, but it shows the backyard um, as it was adapted to be a playground. Children are shown using a swing set and a teeter-totter while younger children sit together playing card games. A Black reformer stands toward the back monitoring the activities. This arrangement, however, wasn't really ideal for what the branch was trying to accomplish. They didn't want to have to cram in both healthcare work and childcare into the same building. So in 1907 or possibly 1908, uh, the Henry Street Settlement agreed to keep the healthcare services in this location on West 60th Street. And Union Baptist was approached about using the spaces at 202 West 63rd Street to um, be used for their work with children. So finally, this brings us back around to um, 202 West 63rd Street. Uh, by 1908, the building at 202 West 63rd was still occupied by the Walton Kindergarten. The kindergarten's success had seemingly attracted the attention of the Henry Street Settlement. Um, and admittedly, I really don't know how this process unfolded. There are a lot of gaps in information. But in 1909, the kindergarten was absorbed and the building came under the control of the Henry Street Settlement. And they renamed the branch to the Lincoln Settlement House or just Lincoln House. For Union Baptists, this was probably a big financial incentive here. As I mentioned, the church was in a huge amount of debt due to their ambitious building program. And while Union Baptists continued to own the building and Sims sat on the board for Lincoln House, uh, the Henry Street Settlement paid an annual rent of $1,500. Crucially, the Henry Street Settlement also paid $8,000 to remodel the building, which included expanding the structure to accommodate a fourth story, which is what we see here. Renovations were badly needed, um, given that under the Henry Street Settlement, Lincoln House decided to reevaluate the best use of the building. With spaces in Phipps House's number two dedicated to the branch's um, kindergarten work, it was decided that 202 West 63rd Street would be used um, uh, it would be more useful to the neighborhood's children and mothers as a site focused on nursery work, so younger children. With the explicit purpose of providing nursery services to mothers who work during the day, the Lincoln Day Nursery was established in 202 West 63rd, um, headed by a white board of directors, but almost entirely staffed by Black women. There are competing accounts, but it is very likely that the Henry Street Settlement was convinced to establish the nursery by a woman named Emma Green, um, a Black woman who had founded something called the Hope Day Nursery in the Tenderloin, um, which was the city's first free kindergarten for Black children run, importantly, exclusively by Black women. Green, who by some accounts was the first registered Black nurse in New York, pushed for the creation of these day nurseries after two children burned to death in fires while their mothers were at work. At Lincoln House, Green served as the first superintendent of the nursery. The first floor of the renovated 202 West 63rd Street building opened to a mother's reception room. Mothers were expected to bring their children washed, dressed, and fed by 7 a.m. The organization also had enough money now to um, uh, not need to rent out the ground, ground floor as a commercial space. So on the second floor was an office for the superintendent, Emma Green, at first at least, um, position closest to the street, and at one point a gymnasium was added. Closer to the rear of the building on the same floor were rooms for the Walton Kindergarten and a music school. In the evenings, these rooms were used to host various clubs, primarily ones for mothers. This is probably also where an organization called the West End Workers Association met. This organization was comprised of religious leaders, teachers, district nurses, social workers, and doctors from the neighborhood. Though their ex exact purpose and work is unclear, um, the one report notes that some of their focus was on improving the relationship between the police and San Juan Hill residents, um, as well as maybe a focus on tenement conditions. Uh, they seem to have uh, been at least 
uh, relatively well known within the neighborhood. Significantly, the association, association was headed by both um, George Sims and St. Cyprian's Reverend Johnson, uh, an arrangement indicative of efforts to link together common causes in the neighborhood, regardless of um, denomination or the geographic background of those seeking aid. And this is not, of course, the only instance in which Union Baptists and St. Cyprian's partnered. There were actually quite a number of initiatives, um, activities that the two churches partnered together on. The third floor of 202 West 63rd Street was reserved for the nursery and included a dining room for staff and children. The added fourth floor contained the kitchen, laundry, and bedrooms for several staff members. The rear of the fourth story was also designed to include a small roof garden where the children could play during the warmer months. The care of infants by Lincoln House was a much publicized and significant component of fundraising in the first few year years of the organization's consolidation under the Henry Street Settlement. Photos were printed in newspapers and Henry Street pamphlets celebrating the annual baby shows held in the building. Um, despite the apparent demand, the Henry Street Settlement chose to discontinue the nursery in 1914. For mothers, the fees charged by Lincoln House were often um, too exorbitant. The center charged 10 cents a day per child or 25 cents for three children from the same family. This was roughly double what was generally charged in white day nurseries. Mothers also voiced hesitancy about using the service. When surveyed, a number of Black mothers cited essentially animosity between themselves, their children, and the nursery's workers, um, which were tantamount to the financial constraints as reason for not using the nursery. So it's not just financial. There were obviously um, deep like social class and race um, tensions at work. Though many of the nursery's workers were Black, mothers evidently still felt that the institution's reformers did not incorporate their desires for child rearing or accept the conditions that brought mothers to use the service. In place of the nursery services, the building's rooms were reconfigured to prioritize industrial training for adolescents. Uh, it is unclear precisely where in the 12-room building each activity took place. Um, I'm sure things moved around a lot, but classes for girls included housekeeping, sewing, cooking, dancing, and more generally, similarly gender-appropriate classes. Uh, boys were offered a debate club, carpentry, and basketball. An indoor gymnasium was added, which um, possibly replaced the third-floor nursery space. Uh, the Henry Street Settlement also purchased or rented attractive land on 218th Street to be used by Lincoln House children to grow vegetables to be eaten by their families in the warmer months. Um, though the mothers of the neighborhood seem to have still desired a day nursery, albeit one run a bit differently than the Lincoln Day Nursery, San Juan Hill was left with a dearth of operations for infant care in favor of programs that were largely designed as preparation for labor or for girls' domestic life. So by the mid 1910s, there is really a rich charitable landscape in San Juan Hill. And of course, this is very racially complicated landscape. While usually it's black reformers doing the real work in these institutions and making the day-to-day -day decisions, the reality was that these sort of organizations could not sustain themselves without financial support from white funding sources. And in the case of somewhere like 202 West 63rd Street, this ultimately resulted in a huge dysfunction between what neighborhood residents wanted versus what reformers felt they needed. Over the next couple of decades, of course, the center of Black life in Manhattan shifts uptown to Harlem, and San Juan Hill gets emptied of a lot of the money that had been going into it. Of the four model tenements that eventually get built in the neighborhood, the Tuskegee, the Tahampton, and Phipps Houses numbers two and three. Um, three gets built right behind Phipps Houses number two. Uh, the Tuskegee and Hampton were destroyed in the 1930s and replaced with the Amsterdam houses. Uh, and interestingly, it's um, a man named Ian Phelps Stokes, who was an architect and also um, the nephew of the two women philanthropists who had funded the creation of the Tuskegee and Hampton model tenements. Um, Ian Phelps Stokes actually had a huge hand then in how Amsterdam houses were also designed, and a lot of his thinking for them was based on what, had, um, what he had designed for the Tuskegee and Hampton. But Phipps houses number two and three are still there. Um, but the buildings were sold in 1961 to private corporations to be used as conventional rental apartments. Recent owners have added two floors as well as these glass canopies that you can probably see in this photograph. St. Cyprian's didn't escape Robert Moses's urban renewal plans for the West Side. 
the parish house's building was seized and used as offices for um, relocating tenants whose homes were soon to be destroyed to make way for Lincoln Center. This here is a photo published in the New York Times showing worried tenants trying to apply for aid. The congregation didn't exactly relocate, but they were um, <clears throat> absorbed into the uh, Christ and St. Stephen's Episcopal Church um, about six blocks up on West 69th Street. In 1926, Union Baptists followed the migration of Manhattan's Black community and reestablished their congregation in Harlem at 240 to 252 West 145th Street, though the church retained their West 63rd Street properties and continued to offer services in San Juan Hill for a time. Still headed by Sims, the church purchased the Harlem site for um, $90,000 in state's money, that's about like $5 million, a little over. Uh, on which already existed a theater with seven adjoining commercial spaces. These buildings were renovated several times over the years to be used as a church. As mentioned earlier, likely around 1937, the West 63rd Street Church was either sold to or rented by Father Divine's Peace Mission. Um, and demolition to make way for Amsterdam houses began in September 1941. The Henry Street Settlement opted very abruptly to close Lincoln House in 1922 in spite of its continued success and attendance. Why it closed then is um, a bit of a mystery, although we can kind of read between the lines. Uh, all we really have to go off of is what Henry Street said, which was twofold. Firstly, they cite funding, which is kind of the, always the obvious answer, um, but more significantly, they felt that the head worker, a black woman named Bertie Haynes, who was um, an immensely successful and accomplished black social worker, um, was essentially not towing the line enough. There was a lot of outcry about this. Reverend Sims even tried to intervene and vouch for her. But I think if you, you know, you read between the lines, it's pretty clear that Haynes and the rest of the all, <clears throat> at that time, all black staff were not really um, falling in line with what Henry Street Settlement envisioned for their work in San Juan Hill. So they essentially just closed down the operation entirely. So I'll wrap up here. Um, I think we more or less know the rest of the story. The Lincoln Center Renewal Project and also the construction of Amsterdam houses destroys nearly all physical remnants of San Juan Hill, but in fairness, the area had begun to decline decades earlier. Um, but it is an all tragedy. The efforts of the reformers I discussed tonight laid the groundwork for a concerted Black charitable network to develop in Harlem and continue to shape the built environment in ways that foregrounded local community-driven needs. Wow. Thank you so very much, oh, Jessica. I, I wanted to thank you for sharing all these stories with us and helping to put the heart back into the neighborhood, which uh, has been so abstract for many of us, which is what in, instigated this project in large part to begin with. Um, so you've painted a great picture and you've given voice to so many things that uh, have been ignored in history. Um, and that's, again, part of our initiative here is to tell these stories and uh, breathe more life back into them. So I thank you. Uh, as a quick word to our attendees who are with us, of course, this is being recorded. This will be posted and it will be shared. You'll get a link tomorrow. Um, and then it will be shared also on the front end of our website because we want to continue to make this information public and more known by other people. Um, we have a few moments uh, if there's any questions. I did see one or two in the chat. One was a question about where the, the milk program sat in relation to the dairy in Central Park. And I know the dairy was finished in like 1871, but I don't know when they stopped uh, selling or serving milk uh, to, to parents there. Can you situate that for us? Uh, unfortunately, I, can't. I was just talking to a colleague who actually is much more well-versed on health centers, district health centers, and these sort of initiatives than I am. Um, it's kind of a very small part of my work. Um, and neither of us knows what happened to the Central Park one. Um, I am sorry, I need to do more digging, but it's on my mind. I'm sorry, I don't I don't have an answer, um, but it is actually something that just came up the other day. I need to figure it out. Sure, no problem. Uh, someone else, Deirdre, is asking about uh, when Amsterdam houses were built. Was that 41? Oh. Uh, I think it's, I think it starts in 41, right? Sorry, that's a little bit so. past my time. I forget the, I am bad with the dates after about 1915. Too recent. Um, well, this has been great. Um, if there's any more questions in the chat, I'm sure you're giving everybody a lot of fodder to think about. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to get in touch with you and we'll be able to either write back to our attendees who have questions or put stuff on the front end of our website. Uh, as another word of uh, advisement, we are launching phase two. 
of uh, which is expanding the map uh, to many of the areas that were discussed in science presentation west of Amsterdam. Um, that will be launching in mid to later June of this year. We're continuing to add sites to the page. So again, I believe Sarah's just put the link in the chat, landmarkwest.org slash SJH. And for those of you uh, looking to fill your social calendar, in about two weeks on Tuesday, February 7th, we have The Scandalous Hamiltons, which is the story of Robert Hamilton, who is heir to one of America's most prominent families, and how he got trapped into a marriage with a dirt poor prostitute who had produced a baby plucked from a baby farm. Um, so that story is brought to us by Bill Schaefer, who wrote uh, the book, The Scandalous Hamiltons, A Gilded Age Grifter of Founding Fathers, Disgraced Descendant and the Trial at the Dawn of Tabloid Journalism. Uh, so taking a little bit of a turn from tonight, uh, but still something that ties back into uh, New York history. Thank you so much uh, for bringing this alive to us and sharing it with us, Jessica. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great night. Thank you.